Welcome back to Sleeping Around the Podcast. You know, I've heard both you guys talk about naps and, and there's good times and bad times. And I don't know how the heck I'd fit into my schedule nowadays sure. for what I do. Sure. So let's just talk about naps. I think that, like, so before even kind of addressing is napping normal, abnormal, when do you use it, how long should it be, et cetera, I think it's important to just kind of frame out what are what are the expected just like sleep norms, right? Right. And so when you're looking at the normal ontogeny of sleep, meaning like the normal development of sleep over time, um, napping is extraordinarily common in childhood, right? So yeah. in the first year of life, uh, the average infant sleeps between 14 to 17 hours in a 24-hour period. And it is by design that it's not all consolidated at night. So I can tell you, we've we've had multiple conversations about this, about yep. we all have children, we yep. all had those sleepless nights, and all of us probably were like, why the hell is it not consolidated at night? Yeah. Why are you not sleeping at night? Well, it's because of the fact that sleep plays such a critical role in terms of neurodevelopment, right? And so sleep is that period of time that is consolidating any new learning and making it into structured memories to, for you to be able to recall. So for that brand new baby where every time that their eyes are open, they're learning something new, that fragmentation of sleep across 24 hours is critically important for normal developmental gains. In fact, if you were to take the example from the inverse and say, what does a child who has neurodivergence, things like autism spectrum, global developmental delay, et cetera, look like in terms of sleep? We know that they tend to be poor nappers. We know that they tend to have decreased total sleep times across 24 hours. They tend to not be napping during the day. And so those are some of the earliest signs that we see. In addition to if I were to put an EEG or sleep study on them, we also see electrographically that their brain does not make the same sleep structures as a child who is developing normally. So, so when you're looking in that first year of life, we see that there's this fragmentation across the day, but does it stay like that? Absolutely not. We see that there is this normal progression to consolidation of sleep overnight. And we see that the thing that starts to go away is those daytime napping. We see that the nighttime sleep elongates, and then we see that the number of naps decrease generally in kind of that first to second year of life. We see that it decreasing down to like maybe two to three naps. By that third to fifth year nap, it's one to zero naps. And by the year five of life, napping should be extended extinguished. Daytime napping is considered abnormal. In fact, even if a child had extinguishment of their napping at year three and then had napping again at year four or five, that would be considered abnormal. Why is that child redeveloping napping? So the same thing is true of that when I see a person who is 10 or 15 or 20 or 50, if there was no napping and now I see a reemergence of napping, my first thing is going, is there a problem with the duration of their nighttime sleep? Is there a problem with the quality of their nighttime sleep? Is there a problem with their timing? Are they not actually getting the right timing? And the napping that I'm seeing during the day is actually their circadian rhythm is pushed in the wrong direction. And then the final piece is, do they have a brain structure that is making them wired to be more sleepy than others? So having a central disorder with hypersomnolence. So the challenge that exists now is saying, is it a problem if that re-exists, right? And if it fits into the social structure um, versus are we fitting our sleep schedules now into the social structure of what we need mm -hmm. to do, right? And so, so what I would say is that overall with what, I think we're seeing in terms of sleep science at this point is that our best bets are when we're seeing sleep being consolidated at night with no daytime napping, but when daytime napping is needed generally as a compensatory mechanism for sleep dysfunction, limiting it to 20 minutes, 30 minutes is really what you need to do. So to simplify for simple-minded people like me and me and mostly Matthew, yes, yes. Um, babies are taking in so much new information that they have, they need the naps frequently to be able to consolidate and learn all the information that they're taking in. Cause this is their, that, that's essentially what I heard you say is that. You know when the baby's kind of doing that? Yeah. They, mm -hmm. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're like, oh, they have gas. Yeah. They're yeah, having yeah. an ice cream. No, it's they might be having an ice cream because yeah. active sleep is actually that REM sleep. Yeah. That's what that's that is. Quiet sleep is where they're really not moving much and they're and they're um doing. And less. you're freaking out, wondering if they're alive. Exactly. Yeah. Now, when you look at a baby sleep, they actually are most likely to go straight into active sleep again, that REM equivalent, and they spend fifty to eighty percent of time in that stage of sleep. So again, why is that important? If you think about the neurodevelopmental trajectory of a brand new baby, what's the first thing 
that they learn. They really are learning those motoric skills. All the motor skills. Exactly. Right. So in fact, their first, very first thing just to back up is is vision because we do from a from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Your occipital lobe is responsible for your vision. So that's why the first thing we see by the age of two months is that them being able to look at you, track, follow with you. But then what are the next things? We're seeing them have head control. We're seeing them able to be able to reach and grab yep. and transfer, like fingers, sit, and toes. do all those things, right? Mm -hmm. And so the motoric milestones are really being reinforced by the fact that every time they're going to sleep, they're spending a significant state, a, a part of their sleep in a stage of sleep that is going to help that become more cemented in their brain. Got it. Right. And so that becomes really, really important. Um, uh, we can also, again, we can also see this happen when we have babies or, or younger kids who are autism spectrum, who have who have learning disabilities, who have global development delays. When we augment their sleep, because typically they're having problematic, we do see them make those same developmental gains. We see that they gain language skills. We see that they gain um, motor skills, things like that. One of the things, and, and so I guess this is a question of, of chicken and egg, is do the, do the kids with autism spectrum and that kind of stuff have sleep problems because of that or do the sleep problems contribute to to both okay so yeah. if if my kid is if i got a brand new baby and they were not napping yeah like early on you know first because i know how my baby's napped uh if if they're not napping or they have an irregular sleep pattern like that is that then a big enough concern for those types of things that you need to like seek some help or like so, ask her. So it's challenging because what a parent may perceive as them not sleeping may be that they just do have a different pattern yeah. and that's still okay. And so we still look at is the total duration falling within that 14 to 17 hours over a 24 hour period. Okay. Um, when we see babies in that first year of life and they're only sleeping like 10 hours of sleep, that's when we're starting to go, huh? Hmm. The same for the babies who are sleeping 22 hours of right. sleep. Both of them are signs of that the brain may not be actually developing the way that we would expect it okay. to. Um, and so what's interesting is I recently wrote a, a book chapter in um, a textbook about um, genetics of sleep. And so one of the things that's really interesting um, as well as challenging is that a lot of these neurodevelopmental syn syndromes actually have genes that are either directly or indirectly related to circadian genes, so our really? clock genes. And so we do see that that probably is contributing to some of these problems. You're triggering these questions for me, Anne, and I, I'm just curious, really, I, I hear stories and, and have seen case studies, and there's some people that just, you know, I, there's some people that get very uh, excited about airway and sleep, and, and, then, and, and it's like, the panacea it's everything and mm -hmm. it's the only thing and there's nothing else and i don't believe sure. that i believe that everything has multiple contributing factors to it but there are uh, i guess i'm wondering if you know of studies related to airway and um autism type behaviors i've seen a lot of case studies i've heard of studies i haven't, haven't read any that i can re recall of early on age three age four maybe maybe even a little bit younger where uh, babies are, I'm going to call them babies, uh, are um, sleep disorder, breathing, snoring, gasping, clinically making the symptoms and noises of that, but also uh, exhibiting some of those types of behaviors, uh, autism type behaviors or behavioral disorder type behaviors. And uh, once they took them in and took out tonsils and adenoids, did some expansion in the in the palate, and, mm -hmm. you know, took kind of took care of the um, of the airway issues, uh, that those things improved in, in many of the, you know, case studies that I saw. So yeah. is there research behind that? Is there data yeah. there to support so, that? So, so there's a ton of research in it around sleep disorder breathing, mainly because of the fact that you're right, everyone is like super hyper-focused. Even if you look at the field of sleep medicine, which was developed in the 1970s, it's had a hyper-fixation on sleep disorder breathing, mainly financially driven, right? Because if sure. I have a sleep lab and I'm I, I'm giving you CPAPs and everything else, I'm making a boatload of money. That now has changed where it's not as financially driven. And, and really, I do think that there's a lot of good people who are doing good science okay. to better understand it. Um, uh, so there's a lot to unpack with that question because when you look at sleep disorder breathing in a pediatric population, it's estimated about three to five percent of children will have sleep disorder breathing. However, when you look at children who have autism spectrum disorder, that number goes up to about a third, right? And what? So is it 30? 
A third. Yeah, about 30. 30. Yeah, but 30 30 is close enough. That's 33%, right? And so the reason for that is because when you're looking developmentally, again, at what are the contributing factors for sleep disorder breathing in early childhood, it generally is adenotonsils, right? Like I have big adenoids, I have big tonsils, and that's your driver. When you get post-pubescent, you generally are really looking at similar things to adult population of obesity, right? Now, why is it in the autism spectrum population that we're seeing something different? Because many of the children have autism spectrum also have other craniofacial features or hypotonia that is driving it, right? Uh So they're overall floppy, their airway is floppy. They have smaller jaws, they have big tongues, they have high arch palates, they have flattened maxilla. So all things are gonna compromise your airway dynamics and give you a setup. This is the same reason that if you look at the, uh, the guidelines for Down syndrome, it states by the age of four years old, every child who has Down syndrome should have a sleep study. study. And then after that, it's horrible guidance. They say you should screen with questions about sleep apnea and sleep. However, recognize that it has a horrible positive predictive value. You have no, there's no correlation whatsoever. So you can have a kid who you don't think has any sleep apnea because they're not snoring, et cetera, and they have an AHI of 100, right? And so the reality is what we know is that 50 to 85% of children and uh, adolescents and adults who have Down syndrome have obstructive sleep apnea, right? That's a huge population. It's a huge, huge. And this is the reason why things like Inspire, the hypoglossal nerve stimulator, it's amazing that that now does have an FDA approved indication for children as well as adults and the children for, specifically for children with Down syndrome because yeah. it's such a huge, huge problem. And because they're, they're not going to wear the CPAP. There's studies in the ENT literature that looks at, I have a child who has obstructive sleep apnea. I um, uh, They also have a diagnosis of ADHD. They're on traditional stimulants. There's a treatment for the ADHD. Their obstructive sleep apnea, they have enlarged tonsil adenoids. We remove them. There's some studies that show up to 50% of those children after removal, ADHD phenotype goes away, medications come off. We have obstructive sleep apnea, ADHD. We're going to randomize them to just treatment, just uh, ADHD medications like methylphenidates, mm-hmm. surgery alone, and nothing. And what do they find? They find that those who got surgery have pretty much close to the same approximation of those who are treated to stimulants and sometimes even a superior performance. Yeah. And so so what we know is basically that this is just a positive reinforcement of that we can't treat sleep as an as something that is nice to acknowledge yeah. that it really has to be part and parcel. And again, looking at the risk stratification, that if you took all 10 year olds or all five year olds or all one year olds and applied the same exact like level of concern, it'd be very different. And so so many would go for, so for years, actually, this even came after the CHAT study, the Childhood Adenoid Tonsillectomy Study, where they actually did randomized controlled trial of randomizing children in early childhood who had sleep apnea and said, we're going to randomize you to early adenoid tonsillectomy versus watchful waiting, right? Mm-hmm. So we're going to wait before we do that. Yeah. And the results of that study had said like, we don't really see any big out difference. Like we should just watch and wait these kids. Why are we subjecting them to studies? I mean, to surgery. And what we now are demonstrating is that when they actually did post hoc analyses where they dug in, they said, what is the different phenotypes of these kids? Mm-hmm. Is there a different risk stratification? The new studies are saying primary snoring alone is a major problem. Yeah. Contributes to worsened behavioral outcomes, cognitive outcomes. Yeah. There also is a differential in terms of your race. There's a differential in terms of what is your baseline neurocognitive. So if you're a kid who has ADHD, you're a kid who has epilepsy, you're a kid who has migraine, why would I subject you to something else I know is only going to make you more poorly controlled, yeah, right? And so again, I think the big failure that we have in a field is saying, number one, why is it okay for an adult to not breathe five to 15 times an hour, where if I had that in a kid, I would be going, oh my God, we, we need to pull the five alarm fire. Well, this is an interesting thing because I've seen patients with kids, with some of my pediatric patients, and I will tell you my kids uh, as well, especially my son. My son dealt with uh, a lot of ear stuff mm-hmm. early on. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize, I just thought he talked funny because he was a three-year-old and then he went to preschool and I realized that I understood all the other kids better than I understood him. Mm. And I'm like, we, let's go speech therapy. So we started speech therapy. Then we'd like examine his ears and his, the, the ENT is like, he's got like chronic ear crap going on here. He needs tubes, but he never complained of ear aches yeah. or anything like that. So we went through that, but he was a kid who was, uh, definitely snoring. Uh, definitely hyperactive, mm-hmm. definitely uh, finger and thumb sucker, mm-hmm. uh, definitely a bruxer, and definitely a bedwetter up until age like four and a half, five. And 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 so as I and this was all around the time that I am starting to get into this. So I'm of course I'm like, well, what's going on? What's going on? You know, and and so I start doing this, and finally, 
I find an ENT who's willing, you know, because the first two ENTs were like, uh, well, he doesn't have strep throat. Yeah, his tonsils are huge. They're yes. massive, but he'll grow out of them. Yes. And I was like, okay, but, and finally, I found a, uh, what I'll call an airway conscious ENT who was like, okay, we'll do this. We did this. And, but then it's like, you got to play the game and system and go through the, the process of the antibiotics and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of it all, he got his tonsils and adenoids removed and we put him into uh, healthy start expansion type stuff. And I'm talking like within a week of getting his tonsils and adenoids out, finger, finger sucking gone and bedwetting gone. Yeah, I believe it. And I've seen it in so many patients as well. So I, you know, I know that there's that, that correlation there. And I know that that goes off subject, but we, we were talking about napping and I'm so sorry, but I want to, cause I've, I've got Keep all going. these, I've got all these questions cause now I'm thinking. So you, you get to see what I've been, uh, I'm telling you, this is awesome. Let's go. This so, is... so let's say just, and, and now I'm getting into the hack. I yeah. want the hack mm -hmm. from you. Okay. Sure. Tell me, um, pretend I'm Dave Asprey uh -oh. and give me the biohack. I'm learning a new skill. I'm learning how to play the guitar mm -hmm. or I'm going to school. I'm right. going to go back and get my MBA. Mm -hmm. Can I He's structure napping. naps 100%. around like, yes. how, how do I structure napping around these things that I'm doing yeah. to enhance my abilities? Yeah. So um, uh, this actually is, is tips that I, I give, it, give very frequently to my college students as well as like when they're studying for finals and things like that, I tell them don't do all nighters actually do um, fragmented napping. So read, study for hour, two hours, whatever you think is your capacity, and then do a scheduled nap right afterwards. Okay. And so do that back and forth. I'll tell you that that's a strategy I applied all through med school. Yeah. <laughs> wow. um, uh, and it's one that, that works very, very well for me. There is a lot of data. Um, uh, depending on the age of the group of, of child and adult learners, there's mounting data to give suggestions around how strategically napping around a purposeful learned activity can actually be very, very helpful for wow. further consolidating. And there's been studies that have demonstrated that when they subject um, individuals, again, randomizing them to napping circumstance, no napping circumstance, that um, again, it varies by age and the type of activity. But typically what they find is that the napping activity one um, uh, generally has a higher, more sustained performance. Now, does it need to be pretty like right after the activity or like so, so can I, would I get say a bite to eat? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why I'm not an expert in sex. Because <laughs> you nap after every time. You know, I'm going to have to push back a little. Um, you know, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I'm just trying to get Dan to laugh. I know he's zoning. So, so, so typically, I would say that um, uh, when when these studies have been done, it usually is not a delayed napping. It usually is more kind of right, right after, after the activity. Um, uh, but I don't know if there's necessarily a science of like how long after does it help. I think part of the thing that that may be facilitating that learning is is the fact that. Similar to um, our subconscious that can drive our dream states, right? Mm -hmm. So we can do things like imagery rehearsal therapy mm -hmm. that we purposely recall things throughout the day yep. in order to manipulate our dreaming state. Mm -hmm. um, or you can do things like lucid dreaming where you purposely do mm -hmm. certain behaviors and activities yeah. to try and induce kind of a dream state. It's and called mushrooms, it's right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with those. And then also be able to mani manipulate your dreams once you're in them. Um, uh, so similarly, I think that when you are kind of in your moment of like, these are things I just learned, this is what yeah. I want to purposely, that I think it does help facilitating that. But not longer than... 20 to 30 minutes or there... so typically I would say that typically you want to make sure that you're not um, uh, doing one activity to benefit that may potentially hurt the other activity right so your nighttime consolidated sleep is still going to still going to happen, happen right, right? Yeah. and so if you're ended up napping for longer than 30 minutes you have the risk of eating into your homeostatic sleep drive right that thing that we've talked about multiple times that's the thing that ultimately is going to put you to sleep and so if you're building that up across the day right you're building up your sleep day across the day that's going to push you to sleep if you start eating into that too much you're not going to get to that point where you're able to fall asleep easily yet got it and so you don't want to risk your good quality sleep at night because of your napping during the day so how do i know if i'm napping if i'm napping because i'm tired and I, how do i know if napping is a good thing or if i've got a sleep problem and i'm tired 
like I'm napping because I'm tired. Because daytime sleepiness. Like yeah. daytime sleepiness. Like, yeah. you know, how do I distinguish? Oh, you know, this is normal. Everybody takes a nap. It's a 20, 30 minute power nap. And, yeah. you know, we go on and they do it in Spain. And, you know, that's kind of just a normal cultural I'll thing. do it on vacation. Do it on vacation. Do it on Sunday place. afternoon uh, versus I'm napping and I'm napping I have because to. I have to, because I'm tired, because I didn't sleep good overnight or I have whatever yeah. other issues. Well, even in your question, you answer some of it, right? So the napping because I have to, <laughs> yeah. right? The napping because I have to, because I can't sustain my activity. That right there is a red flag every time. Right? Okay. If I can't sustain my activity and this is a must have. And so very frequently we'll see this people describing sleep attacks or this, this compulsive need to going to sleep. And so many times people think about sleep attacks and, and mischaracterize even disorders like narcolepsy as like a sleep attack is I'm just talking to and yeah. I was like, like, that is so not what it is. Yeah, it right. is like this strong compulsion need where I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm pinching yeah. myself. I'm like, oh, dreading. Like, I, I'm trying to listen to you and you can see it in my eyes. I look dead to the world. Um, uh, those are really more so like that sleep attack. Um, I would say that it also depends on the chronicity, right? So if you're a person where it's the one off, it's your Sunday thing. Yeah. This is what I do on Sunday. This is yeah. for my wind down and whatever. And that isn't necessarily a pathology because it's not interfering with your normal function. It is a source of enjoyment, et cetera. If you're finding that you're having to make decisions around during the napping, day yeah. mm -hmm. around napping of Ooh. like, do I nap versus do I eat food? Do mm -hmm. I nap versus do I study? Do I nap versus do I make my children dinner? Right. Mm -hmm. Those are all very pathologic. The other time that I would say it's pathologic is like you're going, I'm not making those decisions but I can't sleep at night. I cannot mm. fall asleep for for all my life. Yeah. Well, get rid of that daytime nap because it's eating into your homeostatic sleep yeah. drive. So ideally, the thing that I tell people is that if you can't really tell whether or not something's a problem or not, start keeping track of it. Keep track of your daytime and nighttime patterns so this way it becomes clear to you as to whether or not there, there's a problem there. Um, as a rule of thumb, I typically will say that if you're requiring naps during the day and you're after the age of five, we typically are worried that there may be this may be a sign of a pop. Something's going on with your sleep, yeah. and your nighttime and there, and, there, and there may be plenty of people listening to this going, I don't nap, but I don't actually feel very awake, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so like that's the problem with like something like that for sleeping a scale. People read it and go, what's your likelihood to doze? <laughs> Yep. Excuse me. If you're sitting and reading, watching TV, yep. et cetera, yep. and people read that and they go, "Well, I don't fall asleep watching TV. I don't fall asleep reading a book." Dozing doesn't mean falling asleep. Falling asleep. Dozing yeah. means I'm. Right. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Driving. Yeah. Yeah. Truck, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's that struggle to stay awake. So if you're struggling to stay awake, if you're right? rolling down the window when you're driving, yeah, um, which does not change your reaction time or any type of safety parameter. None of that does. Strategic napping, strategic caffeine. Those are the only thing. Man, what if I had a job where I had luxury to nap? Well, that brings up a good point because you look at a lot of these companies now, uh, Google's, Google. and Facebook's, you and stuff like that. They've, took they've got the napping pods. Yep. yep. Like, what do you what do you think about that? They promote yeah. it, and there's studies out there that basically show increased productivity. And they're smart. They do everything in house. They have their cleaners at the place. They have their hairdressers at the place. They have food they could go shop there to keep them all there. So of course they're going to nap. Yeah, too. Apple's got dentists on campus. Yep. And so I think, but I, but I thought about that, Brandon. I was like, man, because I, I just don't. No, I can't. I, I'm go go go. But if I had a career where I could rest, yeah. Or if I was doing analytical stuff all the time or whatever, so. I do think we use the word daytime sleepiness because we use it a lot because of that's important for OSA and kind of the way we look at, well, don't forget to put on your. Well, 20% you know, of the sleepers. United States is sleepy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we think of it as normal, yeah. but it's not normal. It's common. And yeah. so therefore being able to really delineate what that looks right. like. And a letter of medical necessity, it's very important that I, I coach. Well, and that's, and that's also why the Epworth sleepiness scale is uh, often uh, under rep representative of what's actually happening because we adapt we don't we we it's a self-reported thing mm -hmm. and we're answering it based on our normal day and and our normal day might involve four yeah. cups of coffee and two sure. diet cokes in the afternoon and and, and, and also just like to make the point that again it's not adapting it's desensitization right oh, yeah. so i'm not adapting it's not that i have some biologic superpower that i can adapt to less sleep 
It's that I actually become desensitized to recognizing my inadequacies because of the deprivation of sleep. The other piece that I do think is a really important call out because I want to be sensitive to conditions where napping is part and parcel of the management is that I do think it's important for us to destigmatize napping right. because there are some conditions where napping is 100% needed. Shift work disorders, you definitely, yeah. that's yeah. part and parcel. Isn't it kind of part of chemotherapy too? There's part of the... So, so MD with, Anderson has yeah. To, okay. So, with with anyone who's going through oncologic processes, we recognize that sleepiness and fatigue is a part of the cancer experience, both a, a part of the di the diagnosis itself, but also the treatment. And so, again, as we talked about in other podcasts, where there is a, a immune system component to that drive to sleeping, there is also that recovery component. The other condition that I think is really important and, and is one obviously very close to to my practice is is patients with central disorders of hypersomnolence. Utilizing strategic and scheduled napping is a part of it. And the number of times that my patients don't take advantage of that and don't utilize that behavioral strategy that helps them to utilize less medications is because of the fear of the stigma of oh, other wow. people going, they're gonna think I'm lazy. They're, yeah. they're gonna think I'm, and it, you name the characteristic that has a negative connotation. And that's what people take away. Because can you imagine if we're all sitting at work and then, hey guys, I'm just gonna go and lay yeah, down. Like down for a couple they're they're gonna be like, what do you mean you're gonna go? Rough lay down? night last yeah. night. Yeah, exactly. Hour. There's all these there's all these different negative connotations, and it's like, so you're gonna leave me to do the work while you go and take. Must be nice. And so there's all these types of things that we say. And so when we start destigmatizing the conversation around sleep, and that it's not it's not normal to be sleepy. So just yeah. because you're powering through or quote unquote powering through with your four cups of coffee and your energy drinks, et cetera. That you're not giving me your best you, right? Yeah. Like, so I should not be praising you for optimal performance when you're not giving me your best you, yeah. right? And so the reality is, is the same for people who have true medical conditions that are requiring them to nap or utilize medications to combat excessive daytime sleepiness. I do think it's important to destigmatize that. And so perhaps maybe the Googles of the world are doing the right thing by having these pods. I mean, I know that in medical practice in the hospitals, we have call rooms and there's a stigma around utilizing them. What do you mean you have to go to a call room? You're here to work. What do you mean that you're tired? You have to put your head down. Like, so the reality is, is that when we embrace that it's okay for you not to be your top performance all the time, you're not always on point. I think we're embracing the fact that we're human and that, that it's okay to be vulnerable, but it's also okay for you to nurture what your needs are. Yeah. And I think nowadays too, like the medical world has, it's kind of interesting how important sleep is, yet the medical world kind of grew up in this zone of doctors not sleeping yeah. at all. Where like, it's a badge of honor. Like, you know, residency. and it's like residency and 24-hour shifts yeah. and two days in a row and then surgery. And, and you always got to, like, I always kind of like wondered, like when I'm doing surgery on someone ne the next day, I'm very cautious about what am I doing the night before. I want to yeah. make sure 100%. that I'm there to give my, but- you and and my mom does quality and risk in in uh, hospitals systems and um, some of the stories that you hear yeah, about yeah. the the wrong leg being cut off the wrong whatever being operated Medicine on being. the wrong like it's yeah. it's uh and and there, well, there has just, to be there was just a surgeon I think it was either last year or year before who got basically lost his license and the reason why was because he had a resident who ended up having who ended up completing a surgery independently but it was because he fell asleep in his car so he went out to his car to take a nap and he just like didn't wake up in time yeah and so it was like you didn't give the appropriate oversight to a training resident blah, 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 blah. and so the the reality is is because we're now penalized and again there's probably a lot more pieces to this, but I think just to use it as an illustration, because I don't want people to be like, well, you did this, that, and the other thing, that's the reason why you lost yeah. it. But to use that as an illustration is that when we kind of frame what goes in the news as doctor was sleeping in car, we're now penalizing a person from ever showing that vulnerability or weakness that I was get tired and I couldn't before him and I exactly. needed to nap so that I wouldn't. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's just showing that there's a broken system of that. We're probably putting too much on people to perform at levels that are superhuman 
right? Because there is. I mean, I can tell you, I work in healthcare systems and and it's always about what is your productivity? How much have you done? How much have you seen? And so the reality is, is that there's no value estimation for all the things I do that don't generate a dollar amount, right? When I'm on the phone with a patient, when I'm on the phone with the insurance companies doing peer to peers, there's no money being made. The mm-hmm. hospital isn't seeing me be productive, but that takes hours. Yeah. And so therefore, if my productivity based on what a hospital views it as isn't meeting their pre-designed metrics, they're going to say, do more. And Mm. so how do I do more in the number of hours I have? I have to start cutting back on something else. I think we touched on a lot of naps. Uh, Last question. I got one more question. Okay. Sorry. No, go ahead. It's it's not for you. (laughs) Oh, go ahead. Like I really thought it was for me. Do you you ever catch anybody napping while you're speaking? Of course. (laughs) Well, think about it, where we were. you know why? (laughs) You know why? Is because sleepiness and falling asleep is a sign of sleepiness. It's not a sign of boredom. So I don't ever take it as You don't take it personal. I never take it personally. For me, I'm like, that's the person I'm like, we need to talk. Yeah. We need to talk, not because I'm insulted, but because clearly Uh, we need to figure out what's going on for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. But uh, rarely. I, but rarely. I, I was going to say, <laughs> I've never fallen asleep. It probably doesn't happen to you as much yeah, as it happens to me. I've never fallen asleep during your talk or your talk. Um, not that I'm going to go try to play the guitar and, and take naps and strategic. Yeah. I, I see, I know you. Yeah. You're thinking about I'm, it. Yeah. I, I see it. Yeah. Uh, but just so it's awesome to learn something. So, so thank you for that. I'm stuck on this one Tetris level. And I'm going to start napping after I play that Tetris. You're so weird. Tetris. Dan, Tetris was a game that came out in the. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, I just want to uh, thank everybody for for being part of the podcast and listening. Most importantly, uh, thank you for sleeping around with Doctor M, Doctor Matt, uh, Brandon, and Matthew. <laughs> I need a nap. Okay. Just keeping it between sleep. That's right. Take care.